turn to the book of Ephesians and chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, it's page 1911. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, and reading from verse 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armour of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. <clears throat> For our wrestling, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armour of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm. Firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. <clears throat> the scripture encourages us to stand and to stand firm, to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And reminds us that we have um, a battle on continually, a wrestling against spiritual forces of wickedness, against the powers of darkness. And we are <clears throat> to stand firm against his schemes. The devil has schemes. The Greek word is Methodi, methods. He has ways of working. Turn to Second Corinthians and chapter two, <coughs> where again it's referred to. Second Corinthians chapter two, page eighteen seventy-six. The church in Corinth, a place which was as bad as anywhere in the Roman Empire as far as immorality and wickedness was concerned. And there was immorality in the church. And it had to be dealt with. They had to put a man out until he came to repentance. But thankfully he did and was to be restored. And that's what's been referred to here. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 6. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. He was put out, he was disfellowshipped. People refused to eat and drink and fellowship with him until he came to repentance. So that on the contrary you should rather forgive and comfort him. Lest somehow such a one be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end also I wrote, that I might put you to the test whether you're obedient in all things. Mm. But whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed what I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of of Christ, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes, his methods. What is one of the chief methods of Satan? To stir up strife and unforgiveness among believers. We should not be ignorant of his <coughs> wiles, his schemes, his methods. 
With that in view, turn to Mark chapter 11. If we are to stand against all the schemes of the evil one, if we're going to be able to stand We can only do that with a forgiving heart. We can only stand before God with a forgiving heart. We can only stand against the evil one with a forgiving heart. Mark and chapter 11 verse 25 says this, Whenever you... Stand praying. If you're going to stand before the Lord, if you're going to offer up prayers, forgive. What must we do? Forgive. If you have anything against anyone, what do you think that covers then? <laughs> Anything against anyone. What must we forgive? Anything against anyone. That's what God requires of us. If we are going to stand, dear friends, before God, we must forgive anything against anyone. And if we don't, will not be able to stand. And God calls us to stand. We need to be able to stand before the Lord. We need to be able to stand <laughs> against the schemes of the evil one. And unforgiveness is at the heart of 90% of all spiritual problems, I would say. That's just a rough guess. It's a massive cause of problems. You can't stand if there's unforgiveness in your heart. You can only stand when you are forgiving everyone of everything. We must forgive, dear friends. Otherwise, we can't stand against the wiles of the evil. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. Let's just look at another one of these things we need if we're going to be able to stand, stand before the Lord. Matthew 6 and verse 5 says, When you pray, you're not to be as hypocrites, actors. <coughs> Hippocritos was the Greek word for actor. <coughs> If you had a theatre company, you would have a group of hypocrites. Yeah. Professional hypocrites. They were playing a role. They were acting. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners in order to be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they are very ward in full. But you... When you pray, go into your inner room. When you shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. Whatever is done for the benefit of being seen by others will not stand. Will not stand. Only that which is unto God, dear friends, will be accepted. That's fair enough, isn't it? If our prayers are unto God, then God is obliged to hear them, providing there's no other spiritual blockage. If our prayers are to be heard by others for the benefit of others, then God's not going to hear them. Whatever is done to be seen by men 
is not acceptable to God. Our service must be unto the Lord. Our prayers, our worship, everything <coughs> must be done as unto God. Our prayers, dear friends, should be speaking to God and not for the benefit of others. So we need to be able to stand, dear friends. Let's look at one or two scriptures. Second Chronicles and chapter 29, the days of Hezekiah. Second Chronicles 29, this godly king. Who had a whole heart before God. And came in days where there needed to be a spiritual revival. And so he called the priests together and he charged them. And Second Chronicles 29 and verse 11. This is what he says. My sons, do not be negligent now. For the Lord has chosen you to stand before him. To minister to him and to be his ministers and to burn incense. The Lord has called you to stand before him. What are we called for? To stand before God. He's made us priests unto our God. We are a kingdom of priests and God has called us to stand before him. That is God's calling on your life. <clears throat> Whatever else may be your calling, I can guarantee you of this. You are called to stand before God. He has called you to stand before him, to minister to him and to offer incense. Our prayers are as incense. They go into a great bowl, which is the prayers, this incense offering before the very throne of God, the prayers of the saints. They're an incense offering, and we are called as priests to stand before God. We must stand before Him before ever we can stand before men. <coughs> Turn to Psalm 24, well-known psalm. Page 895, Psalm 24, it says the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. Whose is it? God's. The world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. <coughs> who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place. Who can stand before the Lord? We're called to stand before the Lord. And we need to stand before the Lord. <coughs> but who can? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord. Of righteousness from the God of his salvation. Who can stand? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. What we have done to offend God must have been confessed. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And a pure heart. Our motives must be right. We ask and we don't receive because we ask with wrong motives. That we may spend it on ourselves. We need to be asking according to the will of God. We need to be praying in a way which is pleasing to God.
God calls us to stand. Turn to 1 Kings and chapter 17. A man called Elijah. Just see the pattern, the order. 1 Corinthians 17. Wicked King Ahab Kings. is leading 1 Kings 17. Is leading the nation astray, he's married a wicked woman, Jezebel, and the worship of Baal and the Ashtoreth have come into the land. <clears throat> and God sends a man called Elijah to go and proclaim judgment to the king. And this is what it says, verse 1, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. When we can stand before the Lord, dear, dear friends, we can stand before men. The one comes before the other. When we can stand before the Lord, we can stand before men. He was a man, and all we know about him, he was from Tishbe. <clears throat> is that he is a man who could stand before the Lord. And who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and yet he'd stood before the Lord. He'd been pleading with the Lord to send repentance, to grant repentance to the nation, that they'd turn back from God, and God showed him how he was going to do it. He was going to shut up the heavens so that it would not rain until Elijah said so. And off Elijah went and stood before the king and said, The Lord before whom I stand says, No more rain until I say. Quite a thing, isn't it? But here's a man who could stand before God. Dear friends, we need to stand before God if we're ever going to stand before men. I want to look at one or two things then. <coughs> Turn first to 1 Peter and chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, page 2013. We're wrestling against spiritual forces of wickedness. We're wrestling against the kingdom. Satan is ruler over. He's the god of this world. We're in enemy territory. He has a whole host of fallen angels, demonic spirits that he governs, and he can use in various ways. And for 1 Peter 5, it says this, read from verse 8, Be of sober spirit, be sober, be <coughs> awake, be alert. Your adversary, whose adversary? Our adversary. We have an enemy. The devil. And what does he do? He prowls around like a roaring lion. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere, the devil. I think he can move around pretty fast, but he is not like God. He is not everywhere. 
He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. What does he want to do? He wants to destroy you. The thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. He wants to destroy you. And what's the only thing that stops him? You belong to Jesus Christ. And he has no power over you unless God allows it. Mm. That's the message of the book of Job. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I've written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. What do we stand in? The grace of God, dear friends. We stand in God's grace. We submit to God and we resist the devil and he will flee from us. But we must be submitted to God. We stand in the grace of God, we submit ourselves to God, we resist the devil, and he will flee from us. But we need to watch out for his schemes. We need to be awake, and we need to be alive to them. What else? We need to stand in place. Turn to Colossians and chapter 4. Colossians and chapter 4, page 1930. <clears throat> God has an order, God has a pattern, God has a place for all of us. There are general principles to that pattern and we just had those in Ephesians chapter 5 and the early part of chapter 6 God's place in the family and in the home and in the church Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12 says this Epaphras who's one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always labouring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. What can you stand in? <clears throat> the will of God, dear friends. When we know that we are in the will of God, we can stand firm in it. And that's what Epaphras was praying for these believers. <coughs> that they would know the will of God, that which is good, perfect, and acceptable, well-pleasing to God, that they would know the will of God, they would know the purpose of God for their lives, mm -hmm. so that they would be able to stand perfect and complete in it. If we know what God wants us to do, if we know that we're doing what he's called us to do, we can stand firm in it. Because we're standing in the will of God. The will of God. Amen? Are you standing in the will of God today? I hope so. And I hope there's a good few people praying for you that you'll be standing perfect 
in the will of God. What else? <clears throat> Turn to 1 Corinthians and chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Page 1870. First Corinthians 16, reading from verse 13. It says, Be on the alert. Be awake. Be sober. There it is again. Wakey, wakey. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. If you're going to stand, dear friends, you need to be alert. You need to be awake. The devil likes to work when we nod off. Jesus told a parable and the parable of the tares. And he says, when men were sleeping, an enemy came in and sowed tares. We need to be alert. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Because when we're sleeping, when we're taking our rest, the enemy can come in and do his work. So we need to be awake. Turn to the book of Exodus and chapter 14. Page 113. Exodus chapter 14. Mm. The children of Israel are coming out of Egypt. And Pharaoh pursues them with his army. And they're stuck. And so they cry out to the Lord. And the Lord answers. Verse 13. Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today. The Egyptians whom you see today, who you've seen today, you'll never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. What did they need to do? Just simply stand, dear friends, <coughs> and they would see God's deliverance. They'd see God's deliverance. Who is the deliverer? The Lord's the deliverer, isn't it? We need to call upon the Lord, we need to stand, and we will see God's deliverance. We don't have to do it because we're not the deliverers. He is. He's the Saviour. He's the deliverer. We need to call upon Him and we need to stand and watch the salvation of God. See what God does when we're standing before him, when we're calling upon him. Turn to 1 Peter and chapter 1. We need to have on the belt of truth. Gird your loins with truth. First Peter and chapter one. It's two thousand and eight. I read from verse twenty two. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you've not been 
For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. What's the one thing which is imperishable, which abides forever? The word of God, dear friends. What's the one thing that we can stand on and it will never move? The word of God. If we're standing for and on the word of God, we don't have a problem. And that's all God calls us to do, dear friends. Stand on God's word and stand for God's word. It's imperishable. It never changes. And it won't move. Don't argue for your position. Don't stand for your opinions. We're not wrestling for anything like that. Don't defend your character just because somebody's having a go at you or slandering you. Doesn't matter, does it? We stand for the Word of God. We stand on the Word of God. Stand having your loins girded with truth. What is God calling us to do this year? Stand for the Word of God. Stand on the Word of God. Everything else will change, but the Word of God abides forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's Word will never pass away. When we're standing upon the Scriptures, when we're standing on the Word of God and for the Word of God, we can stand. Whatever happens doesn't really matter. We can stand and watch what God will do. Stand and see the salvation of God. Whatever God wants to do, God will do what he will do. But if we're standing on the word of God, and if we're standing for the word of God, dear friends, then we can stand. We can stand. Just a few things then to help us. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. Page 1867, 1 Corinthians 15. Read from verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also, what? Stand. You stand. What are we standing in? We stand in the gospel, dear friends. We stand for the gospel. We stand in the gospel. We stand by what the gospel says. We stand on the Word of God. Mm. We don't expect everybody to agree with us. We don't expect everybody to accept it. But we stand in the Gospel. Mm. That's how we stand. And it's what we stand on. We stand by the Gospel. By which also you are saved if you hold fast the Word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. 
if we're standing on the gospel of Jesus dying for sin, buried and risen again according to the scriptures, as God planned it, as God revealed it, and as God carried it out, then we can stand, dear friends, we stand on the gospel. Acts chapter 26, page 1814, Acts chapter 26. Verse 22, Acts 26, verse 22, Paul says, And so, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day, testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that Christ was to suffer, that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Paul saying, I stand and testify of what? Nothing but what the prophets and the law said was going to take place. Christ died according to the scriptures. God foretold it. The law makes it real to us. And we stand on it. Mm -hmm. We testify to it. Mm -hmm. And while ever we're doing that, dear friends, everything else is in God's hands. While we're giving our opinion on something, while, while we're trying to promote this, that, or the other, we've got problems. Mm. But when we're standing on the Word of God and testifying to what God has done in Jesus Christ, we're on safe ground. We're standing on the rock and we see the deliverance, the salvation of God. Galatians chapter 5, page 1898. Galatians and chapter 5. We're standing in the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Are you justified by law? Are you a good person because of all the things that you're doing? No. You're saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, Keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. <clears throat> Don't fall back into legalism. Stand <coughs> firm in the grace of God. I'm saved by God's grace. I deserve nothing but help. I'm not loved by God anymore because of what I do. I'm loved by God because of what Christ has done. And there's a freedom in that. And I stand in that freedom. Stand in that freedom, dear friends, and keep standing in that freedom. And don't fall from it. Turn to James chapter 1. <clears throat> James and chapter 1. I'm 
Read from verse 21. It says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For anyone, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at himself, look, looks at his natural face, in a mirror, and once he's looked at it himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he was. The law reveals what we are. The Word of God reveals what we are, and keeps on revealing what we are, and we need to act upon it. And we need to keep a humble, teachable spirit before God. With humility receive the engrafted word. I've never tried grafting. I don't mean work. I mean chopping bits off trees. I would love to have a go, to be perfectly honest. If I had a garden and fruit trees and stuff, I'd love to have a go. But, but the basic premise, correct me gardeners later if I'm wrong, but the basic premise is you cut off a branch and so you make something like a diagonal kind of a cut, I assume, of one tree and you cut a similar kind of diagonal cut into the other tree and you put the two together and you graft them on. But both trees have to be cut. And we need to be cut, dear friends. We need to be pierced, don't we? We need to be broken. Our blessed Saviour, who is the Word of God, was cut off. He was broken. He was pierced for our transgressions. <coughs> And we need to be of a broken and humble spirit to receive the engrafted word. Both sides need to be cut if we're going to receive. And that's the principle to receiving the word of God. We need to be of a broken and a contrite spirit. We need to maintain that humility before God. We need to look at the mirror in the morning and laugh at what we see. And remind ourselves, why on earth did God save me? Why on earth did God choose me? Because I'm a hell-deserving, guilty sinner, but for the grace of God. And so we keep that humble spirit before God. Turn to John chapter 7. John and chapter 7. <coughs> We've read it in James, but let's just underline it. In John. John 7 and verse 17 says, If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. When we approach God's word, we need to approach it with a broken and a teachable spirit. <clears throat> but also we need to approach it with a willing heart. Lord, Speak to me, whatever you show me, may I be willing to do it, no matter what the cost. If any man is willing to do his will, Lord, show me what your will is and I'll do it. <clears throat> Teach me how you want me to live and by the grace of God, I'll live that way. Keep a teachable spirit. 
The other side to that is we need to be sincere. We need to be sincere. If you are going to gird your lines with truth, you need to be open and honest before God. If you're going to stand before God and stand before men, you need to be open and honest before God. What does that mean? It means just being open and honest before God. In our prayer times, dear friends, what are we saying to God? Well, we can learn a few psalms, we can reel off some good phrases before God about how wonderful He is, how mighty He is, and all these kinds of things. Well, praise God, so we should. But then when we pray, are we being honest with Him? Because guess what? God knows. <laughs> Lord, I just need this. You know, I'm feeling wonderful. And, and you're not feeling wonderful. You're feeling lousy and you're ready to give up. What do you think God needs to hear? The truth, the truth dear friends. Lord, I'm feeling lousy and I feel like giving up. Help. If we're going to be girded with truth, We've got to be open and honest with God. And He can make us strong. He is able to make us stand, dear friends. He's called us to stand before Him. But He's looking for sincerity and truth. We offer to God an unleavened, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Are you being truthful before God? Are you being truthful before God? Because it's the only thing he responds to. He knows all about this. Isn't that a worrying thought? He knows our motives. He knows our secret thought life. He knows what we're planning and scheming. He knows what's sincere before Him. He knows everything about us. And He calls us to come and stand before Him in sincerity and in truth. He wants us to go and stand on the Word of God before men to wrestle against all the wiles of the evil one. And he's promised to stand with us. Let's just finish by looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4, page 1962. It's always good, isn't it, to be with other believers, to have that encouragement and support. And it's biblical. Jesus sent the disciples out in twos. He knows what we're like. <laughs> but it's not always that way, is it? Sometimes we're on our own. And more and more in these days. You might be the only Christian in your workplace. You might be the only Christian in your home. You might be <coughs> any number of things. We can be on our own. And this is what Paul says. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Rotten stinker. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Just leave it with the Lord, dear friends. If somebody does you much harm, leave it with the Lord. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repair. 
And if you're going to stand before God, what have you got to do? Forgive everyone, everything. Be on your guard against him yourself. Don't make my mistake. He vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first defence, no one supported me. Rotten lot. They all deserted me. Call themselves Christians. Huh? No. May it not be counted against them. May it not be counted against them. I forgive them, Lord. They should have stood with me. They should have been there helping me. But they didn't. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me. Why, Paul? Because I was standing on the truth. I was standing for the truth. I was standing with clean hands and a pure heart. And God made me able to stand. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me in order that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. <coughs> the devil comes like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But we are to resist him, we are to stand, and having done all, to stand. Have your loins girded about with truth, and the Lord will strengthen you, and the Lord will deliver you. Amen? May the Lord enable us to stand this year in his grace, in this wonderful gospel, May we stand for the Word of God and on the Word of God. And may we see the salvation of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. Lord, for the Word of God, we thank you for this amazing gospel. We thank you for the grace that brought it down to man. And Lord, we just ask of you that you'll help us to stand firm on the truth of your word throughout this year. Because while everything else is passing away, Lord, your word will never pass away. Lord, help us to keep our hearts right before you. Help us to keep our hearts <coughs> clean before you. And Lord, help us to, to learn how to stand before you so that we can go and stand before men. Lord, you're able to make us stand. We thank you one day you'll make us stand in your presence without blame and spotless. And Lord, you're able to do it. And we thank you that that's who you are. You're our strong deliverer. So, Lord, help us in these days to stand firm and having done all, to stand. We ask in Jesus' precious name.